Hello, everyone. It's Charlene Lee, and I'm really excited to be here today to talk about ethical and responsible AI. So uh, buckle up with your seatbelts, because this is going to be a bit of a wild ride. <laughs> it's, uh, it's one of those areas that I've been looking at for a very long time. I had this wonderful colleague, Susan Etlinger, who is now at Microsoft doing a lot of work around AI. And it's and she very early on, um, when she started working with me at Altimeter, was talking about the ethics and the responsible use of big data and how to think about it as a leader and executive. So I'm standing on the shoulders of other giants, people like Suzanne, who have been guiding me throughout for, for the past uh, decade and a half around how to think about the ethics of technology of data and now especially applying it to spaces like artificial intelligence. So let's get into this. So what are some of the reasons why we need to think about ethics? Well, and the way you think about ethics is less about what is right and what is wrong. And the reason I wanna talk about this today is in a highly charged, highly polarized world that we live in today, it's hard to get anybody to agree on what good looks like, what is ethical, what is um, our, our established values, they have shared values. And AI is one of those areas that you think, well, wouldn't it be clear what's good and what's not, what's right and what's wrong? Well, not necessarily. Because what you define as something that's helpful could be seen as something that isn't helpful by somebody else. So for our discussion today, what I'd like to do is have you share, first of all, where you're coming from and what worries you about artificial intelligence. What are some of the things that you can think would go wrong? Now, this is not like the Terminator Skynet that we're talking about. It's more everyday things like, will it not understand me? Will it give me the wrong information? How do I trust it? How do I know it's right? Uh, and so we're gonna talk about some of those things today. And in particular, what are some of the things that we can talk about? And so I think one of the things that um, J. Bryant already has been putting up here is the protection of IP. Uh, that's very true because if uh, some of the artificial intelligence, and I'm thinking in particular of tools like Lenza, that creates beautiful artwork uh, based on a few phrases. Uh, they're using the art and the images that were produced by other people and sometimes copyrighted. So that becomes an issue, like who owns the IP? What rights do you have to it? How do you be transparent about what IP you're using and then pay those creators um, ethically? Uh, Ruby Brown has a point here that uh, doesn't like this conversation, which is like ethical AI is more like censored AI. And we're going to get right into that because I think in many ways, this is less about censorship and more about what does it look like? What does good look like? And for some people like Ruby, the idea that you could restrict what AI could be doing, what it could be saying, we eliminating certain points of view that one person could be seen as discriminatory and another person could see that is absolutely true and right. So which set of values do you anticipate is going to be good? Uh, and so it could be as simple as how do you hire for somebody? And what you determine as good, for example, that you went to a certain school, have certain areas of background, could be seen as discriminatory because you're not taking into account the fact that somebody could have the skills to do the job but may not have the credentials. So you could be looking at different uses of language in those job searches. If somebody uses more assertive masculine types of words in their job description, then somebody who doesn't match that in their background in their resume, for example, a woman, would not necessarily get that job, even though the job is not intended to be for a man the unconscious biases in there could have some ill effects in terms of how you actually hire. And the other point of view that was um, given to me recently is that if you have a certain point of view about what kind of content should be included in a database that an AI should be trained on, do you eliminate more extreme points of view that you may disagree with, whether to the right or to the left? When is it treated as misinformation versus um, treated as a truth for somebody? So this is really tricky. And it becomes even trickier in a world that's again, highly polarized because what we determine to be feeding our AI engines 
is going to determine what the output is going to be. Um, let's see, so Marissa is very keen about this, the increase in misinformation, misinformation and spam that isn't relevant to us. Again, misinformation is uh, what happens when we start spreading a lot of misinformation that may be seen as true or not true by different audiences. So do we categorize some information as misinformation in some contexts and not in others? So, um, and then uh, Jay also, Jay Johnson has says here, uh, it meant we've seen more hazard in finance. Why couldn't a company bias its AI towards profitability? Again, at the expense of other stakeholders, for example, customers, employees, supply chain, the environment, the society. So again, bias in terms of what's fair is a really hard thing. And so one of the, uh, we're going to get, get into this. So a, a couple problems that we have. First of all, the impact that AI has um, also is not going to be uh, beneficially evenly distributed. I've always believed that there's plenty of opportunity out there um, and the ability to tap into that opportunity innately in people is, is you're probably born with it, but depending on the circumstance you're in, depending on the education you have, depending on the access to the technology that AI represents, the benefits could be distributed highly unevenly. So what parts of AI will benefit society? Who will benefit from it? Who will be hurt by AI? Whose jobs will be taken away from this? Because, it, and to understand this and to look at this with wide open eyes gives us an idea of understanding what the impact is going to be. So if we understand what the impact is going to be, if you understand it's not going to be necessarily distributed equally, that not everyone's gonna have equitable access to it or benefit or be hurt by it in equal, in equal, unequal ways, then what's our responsibility to do something about that? Uh, and so it, the reality is that technology, as you have seen with ChatGPT alone, just in four months, we've seen another iteration that come up. It is happening so fast that we as people, as leaders in our organizations, we don't necessarily have the time to, first of all, just Take it all in, understand what's happening, get updated to it, know how to react, get used to this technology. We're not going to have the luxury in many ways to, well, let's see what happens. And this is the reason I want to talk about this today. What do we as leaders, as disruptive leaders, owe our, our organizations, the people we lead, and frankly, owe to society in terms of anticipating the impacts of AI? of this generative AI in particular, because it is so accessible. You just type it and have a conversation with AI and it does things for you. So that's a, that's a key thing to understand is we need time to adapt and use information. And yet this technology is fighting against us because it is the most fastest adapted uh, technology ever to be seen uh, by 2x, 3x that in terms of uh, the adoption and also in terms of the impact. So the first thing is that impact, we understand what that impact is, understand how it's being fairly distributed and anticipate that we're going to have to uh, uh, understand the impacts, the uneven impacts of this uh, in our organizations and in our society. The second thing is something that Marissa talked about, which is the spread of information. Uh, again, it, it's, it's really, we can, you can imagine that all these bots now all these chatbots able to create tons of information against very, very small micro segments and then be able to put it into uh, the, the content distribution, go into social media, target people really effectively, understand what they're replying to, actually have a conversation with them in chat. You may be actually speaking to a bot, not to a person on social media, and they're finally tuning their responses to you to get a point of view across. This is gonna be really interesting to see with the upcoming elections in the United States because we're tending to have a lot of information floating around and whether it's helpful information or misinformation is oftentimes in the eye of the beholder. So how do we think about misinformation and frankly, the huge deluge of information that's gonna be coming at us? How do we discern and, just, and understand what is created by bots, what's being, um, that sent to us from a persuasive point of view and having the knowledge and understanding again to understand and discern what is 
um, what is good information coming at us or not. And then finally, uh, the last ethical area is what we train the AI on. Uh, we, we think should be free of bias, but what if you want bias to be in there? What if you want the AI to be trained, as Ruby says, on a particular point of view to represent your point of view? So we, we know that uh, tools like, as mentioned, Lenza that creates these beautiful images, it tends to apply the biases that are already in the data. So if it represents women as soft, emotional, empathetic, men as strong and aggressive, then it's going to portray those genders with those types of images. Uh, somebody from Lensa says, AI is just holding a mirror up to society. It's reflecting back to us what's already in there. And we know that society is filled with bias, then it's going to continue to amplify that. That, that could be good, in some ways, but it also to be bad, but we just need to be aware of it and understand what we want in this. So like, we got a lot of comments here. Uh, so let's see, we have Rebecca saying, I've been ghostwriting for execs for 20 years. So people's outrage that those reading didn't write the content is a little odd to me. <laughs> I'm a tool for helping express ideas like well designed at AI will be. Uh, Rebecca, absolutely. People, we think that if it's in the voice of an executive um, or if it's in the voice of somebody, that it, it is their words. And there's a little bit of um, suspicion that probably that executive didn't actually write that information out there themselves, but we kind of put the blenders on, it goes with their blessing, but when we know it's an AI writing it versus a human writing it, then people like, get really upset about this. But I think this is a moment in time where we're getting used to it. So let's see, uh, I'm just gonna go through the comments as we go through here. Mark. Great to see you, Mark. Um, how do we define a common set of standards starting point for ethical AI? How have we done it in other times of change, for example, with automobiles? I'm gonna to get to that in just a second. Let's see, just see other um, couple of comments. Uh, Jay has a great question here, which would be a great lead into the next section I wanna talk about is, how does one demonstrate trust? How do you, again, create an AI that's ethical or responsible so that you can build trust? In it. I talked about building trust a little bit last week about climbing the trust ladder. Today, we're going to get into the nuts and bolts about how to actually do this. Okay, so let's get into this. So let me find my notes here. All right, I want to show you just one model, which I really think is, is great. Let me get it up here. And so this is uh, are the principles of responsible AI. I'm going to make this a little bit bigger so you can see it. It's from Microsoft, and I'll put the, the link of it into the chat too, so I'll bear with me for a little bit here while I try to get it out. It's really hard to copy my notes while I'm doing a live stream and posting it into the comments. All right, so that's the, I'm putting into the chat now, uh, into the comments, where you can find uh, their framework for responsible AI. And they break it into two areas, ethical and um, explainable. And, and this in many ways talks about how you build trust to Jay's question. The ethical part is how do you trust that the AI is being basically fair? Um, there's a sense of fairness that it's being inclusive, that it's being accountable, that you can rely on it. Uh, and the explainable is coming back into this era of transparency. Can, you, can the AI explain what it has done? Is there transparency into how um, it, it came up with the answer into the data that is being used. And then also the privacy and security part of it is really important. How are you using the data that's coming in? Uh, how are you keeping it secure? Are you using personal viable information when you're using this and collecting my data to feed your AI engine? So these are some fundamental things around how to think about responsible AI. There are quite a few other models out there uh, that have variations on this thing. Um, I've seen some models that talk about empathy, that it understands who the user is and can um, understand their perspectives, understand their biases, their, their points of view, and take that into account. So there's different aspects of this, but the idea behind it is that our artificial intelligence, as we're building it and putting it into these platforms, needs some constraints. It can't just do anything and everything. And you see that with open AI, they're very transparent about why they're putting it out there for us to all use. They're basically asking us 
to train the AI engine with the questions that it asks. Uh, OpenAI wanted to see what kind of questions would be asked because in the end, AI as a tool itself is actually the tool. The thing that we're looking at in ethics and responsible AI is actually guiding us humans in how we build the AI, how we aim it at different things, how we actually program it to uh, build, bring out the best in people and hopefully tampen down the bad things that we as humans do. So OpenAI clearly states anything that, uh, any queries that talk about violence, um, discrimination, uh, just causing harm to other people, we are not going to allow. And so it gives you a little message if they ask how, what's the best way to build a bomb? It says something like, you really shouldn't be asking questions like this and just won't give you the answer. So that, that's a, a way that ethical and responsible AI is being built. Now the question becomes, what if you have players and platforms and people who have different sense of what is right for you? So I could see at some point there could be, so if you are looking at the world from a particular lens, let's say of freedom, of unbiased, of diversity and inclusion, ethical, and another group just says, you know, I don't believe in that. I want the world to be a certain point of view that doesn't match this world. My point of view of what's right and ethical looks something very different. It's homogeneous. It's exclusive. It's very privileged. We have certain responsibilities. We have the same values in this community. Now, they may, that may not match the mainstream, but for that group, they want their own AI engines. So they will build it. And there's nothing that this group over here that can the mainstream can do to keep that group from building it, using it to create more information, find more people to recruit them. So the mainstream may see that as misinformation and they see them as a truth. And this is the, the challenge of what is responsible and ethical AI is very much being defined by the people who are building it and are going to use it. And so I think in many ways, this is the challenge for us as leaders that as we develop and use AI in our organizations, we have to be really clear about the set of values that inform our platform for AI, for responsible and ethical AI. Because what you determine to be fair, what you think of as inclusive, what you think of as being transparent, are going to be the things that are defined by your values. So let's say, um, Let's say Jay talks about um, how Sam Altman is very, very clear. He's the CEO of OpenAI. And, and he talks very clearly that he's very concerned about AI and its future. He doesn't think we're there yet in terms of the dangers, but he's also very, very clear about understanding what the limitations are. Um, and they're very much, uh, again, AI is not that great right now. It's prone to hallucinations, lots of other things, but it will get better. And what Sam Altman and other people in the AI space, not just only at OpenAI, are all thinking about is, what's that going to look like in the future? What do we have to anticipate today and build those safeguards in? So let's, um, let's continue because I do want to share one other thing, which is something that uh, the White House actually developed. I was, I was surprised, okay, the White House is actually doing some things. This is our government actually uh, doing some pretty good work here in terms of what is going on with ethical AI. And so they have put out um, some a, a AI bill of rights and I'll put a link into that in the comments too as well so you have that. And they are, again, I'm not gonna go through this in great detail, but this is what we as citizens have a right to. Now this is not a law, it's more a hypothetical, it is guidelines, but it's put out there to say, you know, we have a right to having safe and effective systems that are going to protect us from inappropriate, irrelevant data, that it not be discriminatory in, in, its, in, in its algorithms, that we are protected from in our data, that it's not abusive data practices, and that we have some agency over how our data is gonna be used, that there is no an explanation that you know that an automated system is being used. So oftentimes when you walk into and talk to a chat, you're not quite sure, is this an automated system or is there a person behind it? And then finally, the, the last right that we have is to be able to have uh, the ability to opt out of the AI and be able to talk to a human, uh, that there's a fallback, that if the AI just for whatever reason doesn't work, we can get out of it. 
and be able to talk to somebody. So I, I like this because it sets out from a user's perspective, from a, a person's perspective, from a citizen's perspective, what are the rights that should be considered when you're building AI? and building that ethical and responsible framework for AI. So I, I thought that was quite useful and helpful. Yeah, um, so Rebecca, yeah, it was it was kind of interesting to see, yeah, the government is actually doing something about this. Because we always kind of poo-poo and say, well, the government's going to be really behind, they can't do anything about it. And in, in this space in particular, because we've had a bit of a buildup and the, the US government is doing something at least to tap, have a dialogue around this, and I'm going to talk a little bit about what the EU is doing too, uh, uh, also as well in terms of this. So just to give you an idea, the EU has something called the AI Act, Artificial Intelligence Act, and, has, and it defines four areas of risk. And it says these four areas of risk are things to think about, and we have different levels of regulation for each of those areas. So I'll just go quickly through them. The first area that we think is no risk and therefore needs no regulation are things that are using AI for like spam filters. Uh, and so they're not gonna, they're gonna be exempt from new rules. There are areas that have limited risk, things like chatbots, and the regulations are gonna be focused more on transparency that users know that they're interacting with an AI. And there's a third category of high risk. Uh, again, a lot more regulation, things like artificial intelligence that's being used already for things like facial recognition, um, things that may be giving advice on legal matters, uh, sorting of resumes for um, uh, looking for jobs and, and candidates. And in those areas have the potential to cause harm or to limit opportunities. So they're going to face higher levels of regulatory standards. And then for the unacceptable risk categories, these are the ones that are a clear threat to people. Uh, those face regulatory oversight too as well, because they just are going to be unacceptable because you're talking about building bonds that are going to hurt people. So those are the four areas of risk and there's regulations for each of those. And I like this because it's acknowledging that not all artificial intelligence tools are built the same. And it's also acknowledging that AI is just a tool and how we as humans use it is the actual thing that needs to be regulated the application of AI into these circumstances as humans determine what it's going to do is the action that needs to be regulated. So that's a, that's a key thing to think about, about all of these. So the key question is, how do you actually build an ethical AI platform? How do you actually do this? Um, and so uh, one of the things that I really do like is this one um, framework from the National Institute of Standards and Technology. And again, this is my, my final last framework that I'm gonna put into the chat so you can go and take a close look at this. This is a really nice post by uh, Data Nami that uh, actually lays out what this framework does and how to use it. What I like about it is that it's a very simple framework of map, measure, and manage. And again, it's not a regulatory, it's more suggestions, there's no law behind this. Uh, but it's a starting point for how we as leaders of organizations can put in place ethical AI, responsible AI, and start thinking about this. So the first area is really about mapping, defining what is good and also what is bad. What are the impacts, the benefits, and also the negative impacts of AI in your organization and, and also potentially in broader society? So being very clear, what's the intended purpose of the AI, what are you going to do with this? And in particular, what are so, also what are the potential um, harms? So we're doing some research right now that looks at the benefits of AI. So for example, it can write copy a lot faster. So if my marketing department is going to use AI, then we're gonna have some rules around what the benefits are, how it's gonna be used, to be transparent about how not to just take um, copy verbatim from a, a, an AI tool and, and put it into our marketing for all these reasons. But I think it's also to realize that because we're doing this, they, this may actually put some of our copywriters that we employ or hire three agencies out, out of business. We may not be working with them. They may be out of a job. So thinking about that impact on that copywriter 
anticipating this is going to happen. And then being responsible, it's like, so what do we do about this? Are we going to train that copywriter with higher level skills? Are we going to skill them into other areas? If that job is going to go away, then what are we going to do to make sure that this is taken care of? Because if we don't do this, that you run into this problem that if we don't think about the downsides of a new technology, then we run into disruptions that actually start tearing apart our social fabric of inside the organization um, and inside our societies and inside our communities. And that's what we want to protect against more than anything else. So this is why the mapping at the very beginning of the process is so important. So we can anticipate all the benefits, but also all the negative impacts of AI. And then we can start taking um, measures to actually do that. So the measures are the second part. So let me just flip back to this framework. The measure is to be able to both measure both quantitatively and qualitatively what is going on here? What are those risks that we have so that we can identify them and then be able to do something about it? So how do you assess the risk and the benefits? How do we actually track it? How do we analyze it? What do we do about it? And, and I'm not gonna to spend too much time around this, but it's really uh, being able to look at and define those benchmarks, understand if this is the benefit, let's quantify that. If this is the downside, let's quantify that and actually track and measure and see what actually is happening. And then the third area, just looping back into the tool again, is to manage. And the, the idea is that you wanna have the tools to be able to make the changes to the AI or to your organizational systems to manage the risk of the, the deployed AI. So if the AI is going to do these benefits and things, understand the risk is happening, track and measure, and then have the ability to go deal and mitigate those risks. And, and it's in many ways, anticipating ahead of time as a leader of an organization, what risk management resources you need to put in place now, not later on, like, oh my goodness, people are being impacted by their jobs. What are we going to do about this? We know it's probably going to impact their jobs. So let's put in place the resources, let's uh, prioritize those resources against the various risks to our business. And then finally, the governance framework that's in the middle of this is looking at the policies and procedures and, and again, anticipating the regulations that may be coming down the pipe from the EU or from the US government and putting those practices in place, knowing that you're probably going to, it's the right thing to do now and anticipating that you're going to do those right things in the future too as well. So I, again, I think one of the things that I think is so important is that we think about and be thoughtful about the role that AI has in our organizations. It is a fantastic tool. And right now we're thinking about all the great things that happen, but we can also very quickly see all the implications for especially our work, the jobs that we do, how that is going to fundamentally change. It is going to be a highly, highly disruptive force in our communities as we do this. So a couple last comments here, and then we're gonna sign off. It's a little bit longer today, I apologize for that. So Rebecca says, I'm a copyright but I'm wary of AI user compensation for being replaced angle of attack. It leads to crazy implications like compensating those would have been stagecoach drivers where there were no USPS. So a great point. This is less about compensating you for losing your job as to say, I think we all deserve to earn a good living. And as an employer, as a somebody who uh, wants a healthy and um, aligned workforce and have people have agency over their future, is to have a frank conversation to say, Rebecca, we're using these tools and the way your job is being done is going to change fundamentally. And so I would like to talk to you about how are we going to uh, think about how your job is going to change, what new skills you need to have, and potentially be shifting things around. We may not even have this position because we don't need as many copywriters anymore. So what are the opportunities that here in the organization and maybe even outside that are out there that can use your skills and how do we upskill you into other areas of work? So those stagecoach drivers, they learn how to drive trucks. Our copywriters are going to have to learn how to use AI and be more strategic in the thinking. Uh, but it also means that people coming into the workforce would not be looking at those jobs, so they need to be thinking about other areas. And this is the role of technology. This is nothing new. With every new wave of technology that comes in, we have to think about what's the ethical way to think about 
the impact of this, anticipate it, and do something about it. So, Rebecca, thank you for that. I'm glad that it's helpful to you to think about this. Uh, Christopher has a great point. Do you think we need an AI governance error for each company? Yes, we do. Each company needs to have an understanding about how the technology is going to be used, how um, we're going to use data, collecting it externally or even internally, how we're going to be fair in the application of that, how we collect it, how we're going to be inclusive, not discriminatory, all those things are going to be so important to understand. So it's not responsible use of artificial intelligence unless we think about these things. Look at them, again, map out all the benefits, map out all the negative impacts, put in place how we're going to measure those benefits and negative impacts, and then manage those so that it is an asset that we can use responsibly. And it's the same thing with any sort of auto automation or technology, email, whatever it is that you're bringing in, it changes the way we do work. And to thoughtfully, carefully think about this, put the policies and procedures in place to govern how AI is being used in our organizations is the responsible ethical thing for us to do as leaders. All right, that's what I have for today. Uh, let me share with you what I'm gonna talk about next week. I'm gonna have a friend of mine, my colleague Scott Siegel join us next week. Uh, he's a manager consultant at PA Consulting. We're going to be talking about neuroscience analytics. It is this really cool area where it's being used, especially in retail environments, where you can actually see what people are paying attention to. It's really cool science and analytics that's changing rapidly the way that we understand how people shop. And paying off of this, it has a lot of ethical issues, too, as well, about how the data is collected and how it's used. So we'll, we'll get into this a lot more next week. I just find it to be a fascinating area. I've been digging more into it. And I wanted to invite Scott to come on, on board next week and have a quick discussion about what is this? How do we get, what's so exciting about it? What are some of the concerns around it? And also how you can start thinking about it can be used in areas outside of retail. So join me next week as you continue thinking about this. Just want to expand all the options and things around all this disruptive new technologies and how we as leaders can use it. Thank you so much for joining this week. I would love to continue the dialogue. Please message me um, and, and continue through, through all the various social media platforms, email, whichever channel you choose to talk about this, this era of ethical AI. It is a fascinating area. There is no right way to do this. The important thing is that we think about it in that we put in place these frameworks and models that we can use inside our own organizations. All right, thank you. Take care and I'll see you next week. Bye-bye.